Good morning and welcome to the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs webinar on creating an anti-racist organization. My name is Logan and I'm the Child Advocacy Specialist here at the Coalition and have had the pleasure of coordinating this webinar with our presenter from the Portland Women's Crisis Line, Rebecca Nichols. Trainings on pertinent topics such as this are one of the ways in which WICSAP strives to support your work as advocates for all sexual assault survivors. For those of you who may be less familiar with the Coalition, we are also available to our members for any questions or resource needs you may have in your daily work. Before we get started, I just want to cover a few brief logistics for today. Hopefully everyone is hearing the audio okay through your phone line. Uh, please let us know via the chat box if you are having any problems with volume or clarity. All the phone lines are muted, so we will be using the chat function in the bottom corner of your screen for any questions and comments throughout the webinar. We want this to be as interactive as possible, so please feel free to share your thoughts as we go today. An attendance confirmation email will be sent to you following the webinar. This serves as your proof of training hours, so please keep this for your records. Rebecca's slides and a resource handout will also be available for download in this email. We will also be posting the webinar recording and materials on our website under the Trainings and Events tab, so please um, feel free to check back on our site in a week or two to access this as well. If you are sharing a computer with a colleague and either didn't register or didn't log into the webinar using your personal link, uh, please just send me a quick email with your information so we know who is joining us today. This also helps us to make sure that everyone on the call receives proof of their training hours. My email is logan at wcsap.org, and I'll pop that in the chat box here in just a moment as well. And finally, as always, we would greatly appreciate your taking a few minutes to fill out the evaluation at the conclusion of today's webinar. We are very excited to have Rebecca here with us today to talk about this very important topic and share her organization's experiences. Rebecca also presented this workshop at our annual conference in May, but we wanted to make sure that those who weren't able to attend the conference still had access to this great training. So um, if you're ready, Rebecca, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Logan. Sure. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. I'm Rebecca, and I'm from the Portland Women's Crisis Line. And um, full disclosure, this is the first time I'm presenting in a webinar format, so I will do my best to watch the chat box, and Logan is doing the same thing. Um, also, I'm going to do my best not to feel like I'm just talking to myself on the phone, um, but it is, like Logan said, such an important topic and one that really um, will take a lot of conversation. So as much as you can, um, just be, be chatting, be co commenting on the things that I'm talking about. Okay. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time telling you about the Portland Women's Crisis Line. We go by PWCL. Um, but one thing that I do want to talk a little bit about first is that we are a feminist organization. And the reason why this is really relevant um, to this topic is because we see oppressions as incredibly linked to one another. And so part of our feminist value is recognizing that to to end domestic and sexual violence, we really need to focus on all oppressions, understand that they impact survivors very greatly, and that it also impacts our service delivery. Um, so I want to just talk about that. And also, one of the things that we learned a few years ago is that we, you know, we've always been a feminist organization, but it really took us defining what that meant for everyone to understand what how that related to the organization. So we all were operating from different definitions of feminism. We had to come together and figure out what, what our organization's definition was so that we were all on the same page. And we have to do that around anti-racism work too. We have to have a shared definition we're working from so that everybody at PWCL knows what we're working towards. Um, I'm going to show you a silly picture of me later, but if you're curious what I look like, I'm the person in the sign on the right saying that, uh, with a sign that says, I'm a mother. This is a picture of folks from PWCL um, at a recent little photo shoot we had for a weekly paper. Okay. So when you registered for the webinar, you probably looked at the workshop objectives. I'm not going to go over these one by one. Um, 
but basically we just want to talk about becoming an anti-racist organization because it's really critical to the work that we're doing. Um, we also just want to share a little bit about what, uh, what our plans have been towards the school and to fully acknowledge that um, we are about one year in to the process, so we have a lot of work yet to do and work that won't ever be finished. Um, I, like I said, this topic is really best if we were sitting around together having a conversation. The webinar format is a difficult format for us to really have dialogue, so um, please use that chat function. Please participate as best as you can. One of the things that's also true for me in terms of full disclosure is as a participant, I'm not a very good, uh, I don't do webinars very well. I get really easily distracted by my email and by the work on my desk and all those things. So that might be happening for you. Um, so, you know, turn off the email, try to focus just on the topic and participate as best as you can. Okay, here's your first opportunity. If you could just go ahead in the chat box, tell me where you're located geographically, and also tell me um, if you're an advocate, advocate, a supervisor, a volunteer, or what your role is in the organization. Okay, I'm just seeing one person so far. There we go. Great. <laughs> it's fun to see all these things spin through the chat box. Okay. Rebecca, well, it looks like an, yeah. The participants can't see the box, so if there's anything. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that reminder, Logan. So it looks like we've got folks all over the country participating right now. We've got, of course, quite a few people from Washington. We've got people um, throughout Oregon as well. We've got the National Sexual Assault um, Resource Center on here. We've got folks who work in domestic violence shelters. Um, we have people who are supporting people being trafficked. We have um, people in human resources, volunteers, and advocates participating as well. Looks like we've got a couple of directors too, which is great. Um, we have people who are advocates with um, different language capacities, and like I said, advocates in shelters. Looks like advocates doing work with adults and youth. We also have a board member on here. Welcome, thank you for participating. Um, we have somebody who is both an advocate and does admin, which is pretty typical. We have a few different roles. Um, and then we also have folks doing primary prevention and um, sexual health education, so this is great. Thank you so much. Um, this really gives me a great idea of how robust of an of a, um, audience we have, which is really exciting. So now that I know who you are, I'm going to show you, tell you a little bit about who I am. Um, that's me up in the corner with a red circle. Um, that's me in about 1979, um, about four years old. And then down below, um, this is the Portland Women's Crisis Line. This is our staff last year. Uh, last year was our 40th birthday. And um, this is a little photo, another photo shoot. We have an annual weekly paper uh, thing where uh, we take these fun pictures. Anyway, so one thing you might notice looking at looking at all those people is that there sure are a lot of white people there. And I think that um, one of the things that's true is that, you know, at, at the Portland Women's Crisis Line, we really, over the years, been, were, were really blocked by the fact that we were primarily a group of white women and um, didn't really know. We knew that there was a lot of desire to do racial justice work in our organization, and we also recognized that we had a deficit because um, we were a pretty monolithic culture, mostly, mostly women around the same age group, um, primarily Caucasian, and also... Um, similar political views and class. And so feeling like if we're so similar, um, how do we really do this work? So what became really important to us, though, is that we had to do something, that we couldn't just um, know this was an important issue for survivors and not make it somehow integrated into our organization. 
And over the years, you know, I had some really good conversations with colleagues about this idea that, that PWCO wanted to do racial justice work but didn't really know where to begin. And I had some smart people say, you know, you can be the best group of allies as possible. You can really unpack your privilege and try to um, make sure that it's, you know, you understand how it impacts your service delivery too. So there's lots that, there's a lot of things that a group of primarily white people can do around anti-racism. Um, I also had had a nice conversation with Vanessa Timmons, who's the director of the Oregon Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. And the way she put it to me is that anti-racism is white people's work to pick up and do. And this made a lot of sense to me, um, spending my career doing domestic and sexual violence intervention work, that we know that, that men, when men talk to other men about violence against women, it can have a really strong impact and that conversations can go really far. So perhaps there's some value in, in a group of white folks talking about anti-racism and really demonstrating its priority in service delivery for survivors. I think too, it's important to mention, and I said this at the conference in May, that when we were first approached by WICSAP to do this webinar, there was a lot of discomfort at our at our equity and inclusion committee because we are primarily white and feeling like, um, is it makes sense for us to, to play this role talking about something that we don't, we've just started to do, we don't really know. You know, I can tell you what we're doing and, and why, um, but it's very new to us. Um, and so it really took, a, again, a willingness just to do something so that we aren't just standing by. And, and talking with Vanessa too, she said that, you know, in her experience, people aren't really doing, you know, organizations aren't really doing this work, you know, stating they're anti-racist and, and trying to take some specific steps to get there. And so, and that's kind of demonstrated by how many people are participating in this call. There's a really big desire to do this work, to prioritize racial justice. And um, we got to do something because it's definitely impacting survivors. And another thing, you know, talking with, with colleagues about, you know, white folks doing anti-racist work, um, I had someone talk with me about, you know, it's, I was describing to her what PWCL was working on and what we were doing and kind of the steps we were taking. And, and she said, you know, that sounds nice, but basically what if you're creating the best anti-racist organization for white people? Um, that's probably not what you're trying to do, but that might be what you end up doing if you are a monolithic culture. So that's something that I really heard loud and clear and want to um, figure out along the way. One of her recommendations was that any work, any intention we're setting as an organization, we should also be immediately incorporating programming that, that um, draws in communities of color so that it becomes an integrated community within PWCL2. So that's something that we're talking about as well. I also want to read you a quote. When you see this, um, like Logan said, you're going to get a list of resources and there's a list of books and websites. So I'm going to give you a quote from Tema Okren from White Racist to White Anti-Racist. And Tema writes for dismantlingracism.org. And the quote is, any usefulness found here should be credited to the larger community of anti-racism activists. Any errors or flawed thinking is mine alone. And I think that that's really true. <laughs> I think that um, part of going out on a limb and doing this presentation and, and talking about this as an organization is that I'm expecting that I'm going to make some mistakes along the way. I grew up with privilege and I'm not going to see that all the time and I'm going to, I'm going to hurt people perhaps by my words and my actions and it's really important that I'm willing to make those mistakes. I'm willing to be told when I've made those mistakes um, and that I am a person, you know, I'm an individual trying to do this work and that there's a rich, rich history of anti-racist organizing and activism primarily by people of color. So a lot of what I know now, I learned from their their expertise and their wisdom and I'm a person who is going to do my best along the way. Okay. So um, like any workshop, we're going to talk a little bit about um, guidelines because this feels like more of a more likely to be a, a more of a one-sided conversation. Um, this is more sort of the intention that you can know that I'm having when I talk and also as you're participating in the workshop, the same kind of guidelines that you can work within. So 
The first one is just knowing the difference between intentions and impact. And I think that this is a this is an updated version of assume best intentions. You know, when we're talking about prejudice, we understand that someone might someone might work from their good intentions but have a very negative impact um, by something they say or do. And so when we're talking about anti racism, that's very, very true. And that we can assume that one that we each have good intentions, but we also have to know that our actions are going to have an impact on other people. And it's important to understand that you have to be accountable to the impact, regardless of how good your intentions are. I also think it's important that we really share from our own experience that we are willing to um, talk with each other openly and directly and recognize that our life experiences really shape our values and ideas and um, we're all working from different ones. Of course, we want to use accepting and non-judgmental language and um, again, recognizing that language is a powerful tool that sometimes we have to really be willing to change, use new words that um, are an adjustment. Also, a general guideline that I think is good whenever you're talking with folks about anything challenging or difficult is listening to understand and not to respond so that you're really trying to hear the person and talk um, or think about what they're saying and not think about what you're going to say in response. Of course, whenever we're talking about anti-racism and social justice, we got to question our own assumptions. We have to acknowledge when we feel defensive. Um, and again, that's going back to intention versus impact, knowing that um, defensiveness is usually a sign of a place where you can do a little work and growth. And then I think, again, another important piece about uh, anti-racism work is not to assume other people's personal identities. We know that um, there are lots of folks who are multiracial um, and have rich histories and rich uh, relationships or across communities of color, and we don't want to make assumptions based on what somebody looks like. Okay, so I'm going to start by talking about what the Portland Women's Crisis Line has done, and then I'm going to talk more about kind of why and how. And this really came out of our strategic plan, which we are one year into. It's a three-year plan, and what the one of the things that we prioritize. We have four what we call strategic directions. So those are the overarching goals of our organization under this plan. And one of those strategic directions is providing equitable services. And underneath that, one of the, I guess, subcategories is to become an anti-racist organization. And the ultimate goal is equitable services. And so everything we're doing should translate back to our service delivery so that survivors of color are having positive experiences when they access our organization and also that they have the right access to our to our advocacy. Um, and so that's ultimately why we're prioritizing becoming an anti-racist organization. So the things that we've done since we created the strategic plan is we formed an equity and inclusion committee. And, you know, speaking of how language changes and how we have to change with it, um, sorry, I just got distracted by someone's comment that the road to hell is paved by good intentions. That's probably pretty accurate. Um, so speaking of language and how it changes, what we used to call cultural competency these days, I think we call equity and inclusion. Um, I think it's an important distinction to make. So that's the name of our committee. And I think that part of what, um, when we're talking about equity, we're talking about that people have um, access to services and also that we're responding to individuals with their individual needs and um, areas where, where they have challenges and that across different cultures, that's going to look really, really different. And so we might need to do a different kind of advocacy depending on who the survivor is and what they're bringing with, you know, their set of needs and safety plans. So getting a little distracted. Equity and Inclusion Committee is made up of a few staff members, a couple of board members, and a couple of volunteers. It was important that we had um, representation from those different tiers of our organization. We meet um, monthly, and we um, work together with some of these other tasks on here are being done by the Equity and Inclusion Committee. Um, we started the year by surveying our staff about how what they identified the reason that we should become anti-racist and also they what concerns they had and this was an anonymous survey so folks could just sort of fill in their their questions and, and comments and also we shared 
their responses with everybody at our first, the first staff meeting where we talked about becoming anti-racist. And this was really just to honor the fact that there were plenty of concerns, but also there was a, there happened to be a common understanding of why it was important to the organization and that was really important information to know. We might have found that there wasn't a clear, um, that people didn't have a clear understanding of why we needed to prior to prioritize becoming anti-racist. So this was a helpful way to kind of get that conversation started. Um, last month we had a retreat with board staff and volunteers about defining what PWCL means by becoming anti-racist. We used an outside facilitator for the retreat who met with myself and then met with um, our equity and inclusion committee and then facilitated this retreat to kind of help us come up with that shared definition that I, when I was talking about being a feminist organization before, we knew that um, we needed to work from the same definition together. We also assume that any organization that makes this kind of commitment is going to have their own definition for becoming anti-racist and that um, it's going to depend on, on, you know, the strengths you have as an organization, the goals that you have in your own mission. So this, what our definition might be, it could be a little bit different than a different organization that's maybe working on reproductive health or something like that. And um, let's see. I think, too, one of the things that I kind of learned in doing the retreat is that, um, you know, as an organization, we've made this commitment. So that means that our board has also made the same commitment around becoming anti-racist um, and that our volunteers who have gone through our training, you know, they've made, they understand that, too. Um, and I think I know actually we have one of our volunteers on the line. So um, that person could maybe say whether or not uh, – it's, it's seen at that level or not, that this is a commitment that PWCL has. But having this retreat really kind of opened up a potential can of worms because it made us, you know, by coming all together, all levels of the organization coming together, we would find out if people had different opinions or if people didn't even understand what racism was or didn't even have introductory experience or understanding of it. Um, and so luckily we we were kind of coming from a same starting place, but working with an outside facilitator, I could kind of tell that that was one of her concerns, that she was going to have this retreat and, you know, have one person off in the corner not even understanding that racism still happens and somebody else, you know, t using, uh, talking about internalized supremacy and, you know, just very different levels of, of understanding. So luckily that didn't happen, but it, it very well could have. Okay. We also, um, at our Equity and Inclusion Committee, each individual committee member interviewed other organizations that have a dedication to racial justice or goals around equity. We learned that two, those are two different things. Um, so, for example, we have peer organizations that also want to become anti-racist and are really bold in using those kinds of words. And then we have individuals where, or we have organizations where there might be an officer of equity, but when we talk about anti-racism, they had never heard that expression before. So don't assume that anti-racism and equity and inclusion offices are going to mean the same thing. Um, we also did two different things that are part of our strategic plan that kind of um, supported this goal, but were also part of different goals of the strategic plan. So that was the survivor-led evaluation and the community partner survey. And these were two pieces of evaluation that um, we basically first asked survivors who had accessed our crisis line to um, participate in focus groups and um, tell us a little bit about that experience and as well as their experience accessing the whole system. And the re we have a report for both of these things on our website at pwcl.org, right on the home page. Um, and through that focus group with survivors, the survivors of color did talk about their experiences um, that were different because they were survivors of color. And so we were able to get some tangible feedback from, from folks about their experience accessing services, which is really important. Likewise, on the community partner survey, we also had um, somebody, we had questions about whether or not people believed or other organizations believed we were welcoming to people of color. We also asked them how they evaluate their services for being equitable. And um, we learned that a lot of organizations do tangible practices, but maybe aren't evaluating for equity. So it was an interesting thing. Both of those things really informed our understanding of our, our next steps. And then these next two things on here, um, these are definitely more of a work in progress. 
Um, so we need to build relationships with other organizations that are serving communities of color, and these need to be relationships that are mutually beneficial. And part of that is so that we are a more integrated organization with communities of color so that survivors from any community would know to call us and ask for support and that um, leaders within other communities would rely on us to support them when they needed some support too. Um, and that part of if we had those kinds of relationships, then the hope would also be we would have a little bit of um, – we would have what we called a mentor or an auditor. So if we were partnering and, and had these great relationships across communities of color or with other organizations in those communities, and we were going the wrong direction, hopefully somebody would help us with that or, or call us call us in around that and um, really help us stay, stay on the right track. So um, these are two things that are definitely going to uh, definitely inform what's next. And then... Let's see. We have a couple of questions I want to answer before I move screens. Um, when somebody asked about our facilitator of that retreat, and that person did have um, did have experience working around equity and diversity and anti-racism. This has so we worked with the nonprofit association of Oregon and told them what we were looking for, and then they have this pool of contractors that have different areas of expertise. So the person we selected did have expertise around anti-racism work. Um, and also didn't have as much experience around the equitable, providing equitable services or evaluating for that, but definitely understood what anti-racism meant. Another question um, has to do with other steps regarding human resource practices and hiring people of color. And those are definitely areas where we will see um, tangible milestones this upcoming year. So these this list of stuff is what we were supposed to be doing this year. And then in the second year, we definitely need to be looking at hiring practices and volunteer recruitment and things like that. So those will certainly be on the list. And then um, when we surveyed other organizations, they definitely, in our community partner survey, when we asked how does your organization uh, evaluate it's, that it's equitable, most people refer to hiring practices and um, like tangible practices in their workspace around representing different cultures. So I think that those really tangible pieces are ways that we can, things that we can incorporate and any organization can incorporate. And let's see. I'm going to go ahead and move along to the next slide. So part of the workshop includes talking a little bit about this historic perspective of our movement to end sexual violence and feminism in general. And I'm going to do this part pretty quickly because it's not as relevant to the bigger picture. But it is important to note that, you know, the work that we do at PWCL is definitely grounded in the feminist movement of the 70s. And um, we were an organization formed by a group of young women who identified that there was just no services for survivors. And they were very much connected to the local feminist movement, the anti-war movement, um, environmental movement, and all these things. Um, so what we know now about those various movements is that there was really this goal of um, finding, finding sisterhood, I suppose, um, really having this idea that women had similar experiences from one another because they because we experience sexism as women so that women across cultures could really find that commonality and come together as as sisters but what really also happened is that a lot of um survivors from different communities so that would include or excuse me not survivors but activists feminists um that would include Women of color would include queer, lesbian, bisexual women, trans women. Um, that this whole idea of commonality that that women of all from any community is, are, are going to have similar experiences just wasn't real. And so when um, feminists of color came to the women's movement, they experienced a lot of racism and a lot of exclusion, um, and that there was a lack of understanding of how their experiences were very different, and that. The movement was really finding commonality and while ignoring the differences, and that that was really detrimental to having to including feminists of color. And I think that um, what ended up happening is a lot of these movements started to isolate each other, um, meaning you might have 
a movement that was primarily white women, a feminist, and you might have um, a movement that was primarily people of color and that they didn't necessarily come together. And in fact, they became pretty isolated from each other, even though they had very similar goals. Um, but because they weren't really focused on the way things, the fact that, that there were a lot of differences between women or between LGBTQ folk, um, they, do, they weren't really as applicable. They, couldn't, they didn't feel comfortable for a lot of people. And I think one of the things that is really important to keep in mind is that the ways that institutional racism happens and the way that folks of color experience that racism every day, that's all going to be part of your movement too. It's going to be part of your organization too. And that if you have really, you know, again, this idea that the road to hell is paved by good intentions, um, you can't just work from good intentions on their on its own. You also have to really unpack the privilege that you carry as an individual. You have to understand how it impacts the way you think and the way you interact with other people. And it becomes really important that um, we really see each other's differences and recognize that because we have differences, we can't know. We, I can't know what your experience is, but I can. I can hear and I can learn from you what those experiences are. And um, when you see the list of resources, you'll see a couple of books around this particular issue. Um, there's a book called The Trouble Between Us, An Uneasy History of White and Black Women in the Feminist Movement, um, where a lot of this information comes from. And so this quote really kind of captures what I just said. So figuring out that capitalism, racism, and sexism were very powerful and that um, you can't just you can't just do you can't just try to create a movement and not um, and and rid it, rid the movement of all of these social injustices that they become integrated into your movement too and that you have to really deal with them. And I think that one of the things that's important about this idea from the advocate level is that that happens and it happens in organizations too. And it can be so discouraging when you come, you know, you become an advocate and you are really there because you have this personal desire to, to end sexual violence. You're trying to um, really make the world better. And then you walk into an organization and you see all these injustices right within those walls. And it's, you know, just so discouraging and you start to really feel like you can't make a difference because even your organization is dealing with all these things. Um, I don't think every organization, I think that, that a lot of organizations are trying to deal with it. You know, I'd like to think that PWCL, we're trying to acknowledge when those things are happening, but it's not a perfect system by any means. And um, it's important that as an advocate, you feel um, there's some hope. You know, you see some successes around anti-racism work and not just discouragement. So I've talked, I've talked a little bit about second wave feminism and um, kind of where the, the history of our work comes from. And now I just want to talk a little bit about what happens today around feminism. So I think what's definitely true around feminism today is that we don't necessarily have the same um, categories. Of, you know, we don't really categorize ourselves in the same ways at all. I think that there is a lot of fluidity around so many different things. At PWCL, I mean, with our name, the Portland Women's Crisis Line, you can imagine that uh, there we were mostly all women for many, many years. We're a 41-year-old organization. We just started using male advocates um, on our crisis line about five years ago, um, and so for that for that entire time, men who wanted to participate weren't allowed um, to participate in crisis line advocacy. So we have seen fluidity here at PWCL happen a lot around gender and understanding that people of all genders are going to participate in our work and that's going to make our work stronger and better for survivors. So I would say that that's certainly, um, I would contribute some of those, some of that open-mindedness to what feminism is like today, that we just don't have the same categories around gender or ethnicity. We've already talked a little bit about how so many folks in our communities are multiracial and really having very diverse um, experiences as, an, you know, lots of races, lots of culture, just different things being very, um, they, there's just more experiences, more identity becomes a very layered thing for our folks. Um, 
I think too, and just looking at some of the pictures in our slides, that when you when you see, I mean, this is certainly not always true, but you've got folks um, pictures of multiracial folks together, and a lot of pop culture includes. Um, this idea that people across cultures are, are friends and hanging out and being together. And I don't know that that's necessarily accurate, and I certainly think most media does not portray enough around uh, multiculturalism, but it's a little more relevant than it used to be. Um, and I think to this last point that intersectionality exists, I think that's an assumption that we should make all the time in our advocacy that any individual is going to have lots of different pieces of their identity and that those are going to overlap. And that's going to mean that they have access to more resources and more communities of support. Um, and it also means that their experiences are really rich and really individual. So hopefully many of you have heard of the book, This Bridge Called My Back. Um, and it was a compilation of essays. And the basic premise was that for women of color, and this was written in 1981, that for women of color, they were literally bridges between um, feminists and the men of color in their lives, and that they were kind of walked across both directions, um, trying to be part of both communities at the same time, and um, really being in a really difficult place because of because of being expected to represent different communities, and that they have um, created this a second edition of that same book, This Bridge We Call Home, and it really has to do with this fact that we understand today that commonality is, is not, that we need to see one another's difference and that we have commonalities too, but that we need to really respect the differences and see them as sources of strength in relationships. Okay. So I've already talked a little bit about how, you know, just as our culture is a racist culture, um, as just as institutional racism exists at all levels of our culture, so does it exist within our organizations and our movements. And I should have said earlier that um, there, within the packet of resources you're going to get later, you're going to see the definitions around, some definitions that I'm working from around racism, institutional racism, oppressions, and things like that. I'm kind of making an assumption that you all have some basic understanding of those definitions. So when I talk about racism is everywhere, I'm assuming that you believe that that's true. Um, so that means that racism also exists within our organizations and within our movements. And that uh, when we don't acknowledge racism, that we don't acknowledge that it does exist, then we're never going to meet our mission to end sexual violence because those, you know, racism and sexism are interconnected and that we really need to see that both are really critical to the, to the work that we're doing when we're trying to end both of those things. And I think, too, that we need to understand, and this is something we talk about here, that this is a, this is a process that's never going to be finished that you don't just become an anti-racist organization within a three-year strategic plan and then you're done. That we are making an assumption that this is a commitment we're making for the long haul and that our job in these introductory years is to really institutionalize the value of becoming anti-racist and integrate it into our into the way we work with survivors, obviously, but the way we interact with each other as a team, the way we re recruit and train and support our volunteers, uh, the way that we create relationships outside of our organization and outside of our intervention system and that we aren't never going to be, you know, that is always going to be a process and we're always going to be learning. I think that whenever we as individuals also commit to anti-racism, that that's very, very true too. Um, the quote that I read to you earlier by, um, by Tema Okun from that article from white racist to white anti-racist talks about this ladder of identity that um, white allies kind of climb up between different different understandings of racism and their role in ending it and that we kind of the ladder is not linear because we can get up a step and then fall down three steps and that work you know I could do this workshop today and then in an hour uh, completely be 
ignorant of my own privilege and really be hurtful. You know, that that's, you're never finished. However, it's something that you should keep working on and something that you can evolve and um, strengthen. Okay. So the other thing that's really real, I mean, I think that we're primarily talking and thinking about survivors of color and their experiences accessing our services and our advocacy. But what we know is also true is that advocates of color experience racism within our organizations too. And that that can feel, you know, I've already talked a little bit about how discouraging it is for an advocate who comes into an organization to try to make the world better and sees these injustices. And this is, you know, 100, 200, 1 million times worse for advocates of color who walk into the, our organizations and, and experience that too. And so we have this, you know, an organization that's built to support people, to help people, to make the, the community safer, and yet the organization um, can make some really damaging practices and um, really isolate advocates of color and ignore their experiences with racism in that, in that organization. And I think that a lot of the ways that our, that our organizations do that is by denying that it, that it happens, um, being unwilling to kind of see how those practices are harmful and how our, those practices really um, put people against one another, advocates against one another, and discourage real team team building. Um, we see it a lot with many organizations, you know, PWCL included, are led by white folks, and that um, as, you know, in, a, in an organization you might see that there could be lots of advocates of color who work at a shelter on the crisis line, but that as you go up the kind of management and supervision, that more and more those positions are held by white people. Um, and so that happens all the time in our organizations. And so for an advocate of color, um, what happens is there's, you know, we all know that we need more diverse staff. And I think, you know, one of the concerns that I have in terms of how will this change PWCL is that there'll be this easy assumption that it'll change. We'll know it's changing because we have a more diverse workplace, but I think we need to be really conscious and aware of the way that we support staff of color within our organizations. It's not a matter of, of, of hiring for diversity if you can't, you know, make your employees happy and, and make them feel really settled in your organization. So, um, this is more a set, this is more a example of what could happen if you haven't done that work. If you're if you feel like you're finished once you've hired for diversity and you haven't thought about what those experiences for your staff of color might be like. So, you know, when we are able to um, diversify our staff for a lot of advocates of color, they might experience this idea that um, they might enter an organization and feel really welcomed, and people are really grateful for the skills and the strengths that they're bringing. But then when they see that there's this institutional racism within the organization um, and tries to call it out perhaps, tries to advocate for survivors of color, um, tries to make the organization more accountable or help change some of the systems that exist, that they're not made to feel very welcome, often very discouraged, um, you know, as seen as problem maker or troublemakers or too outspoken or um, too aggressive in the way they like to see the organization change and that becomes a really negative place for advocates of color to continue to work and they leave the organization and then it doesn't matter how you've hired because, um, you know, like I said, the team environment isn't there and folks aren't really encouraged um, again, to see those differences, to have that accountability and to make significant change in the organization. Okay. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a little bit about what happens for culturally specific organizations and and this is really coming from my experience just partnering with culturally specific organizations. So thinking about organizations that are serving communities of color or um, maybe perhaps immigrant communities or um, working with folks whose English who English is not their primary language spoken. Um, and I think that, you know, within with our in our local system, um, we see that most of those organizations are small pro programs between small programs of a large organization. Um, and so they may not have a lot of funding. When we look at the way that our government funding is allocated, they're getting smaller portions. Um, and at the same time, they're really expected to sometimes do our work for us. You know, so examples that I've heard about would be 
when uh, um, someone calls a crisis line and they don't speak English and the, the crisis line transfer them to a culture-specific organization without even finding out if they are a survivor of domestic or sexual violence or what their needs really are. So it's really just, oh, I don't know how to talk to you, so I'm just going to go ahead and transfer you to somewhere else and not, not even do any advocacy. So we're kind of asking these culture-specific organizations to do our work for us. Um, and I had talked about this a little bit before, this idea that just because there might be um, a program within a larger organization for Spanish-speaking survivors, it doesn't mean that the larger organization understands what Latinos are experiencing, or they may not, that larger organization might not have a racial justice value and primarily think of that piece of their organization as a social service um, and not seeing why it's important and crucial. So we sometimes will see culture-specific organizations just kind of get um, expected to take on a lot. And we also know that for survivors of color that they're supporting, those needs are often greater and those survivors are also are often experiencing racism and other pieces of the system, of the intervention system. So advocate organizations really have to work really hard on behalf of those survivors. I know one of the things that happens here in our local system is that we've got culture-specific organizations that are, are really asking for the same thing every time we meet and talk about um, where, where the system is going and where, what survivors in our community need. And it's kind of embarrassing that they have to ask for the same thing every time because we should have listened to them a long time ago. You know, So when they're talking about needing some support, needing to be recognized for the role that they play, and also needing to um, be funded for what we're asking for them to do, and, and they have to ask for that every time. So then we also have organizations like the Portland Women's Crisis Line that are predominantly white and still have a role to play around becoming anti-racist, but maybe don't understand um, why they need to do that. And they might not think it's important because there aren't, you know, it's not a diverse workplace, so they might not understand why they need to become anti-racist. Um, they might, like I said, already mentioned, they might think that all they need to do is hire around diversity and then they're good to go. Um, but there's so much more work to do than that. And it is really everybody's work to do because we know that survivors are experiencing racism when they access services. Um, they're experiencing a lot of different um, roadblocks and, you know, when I, I talked earlier about the um, survivor-led evaluation that we just completed, and one of the things that I found was interesting is that um, of the survivors who participated, every survivor of color experienced some form of racism as they were accessing services, and it, it came out to be, like, one example was um, that when the survivor tried to access a housing program, they were gone, they went through a very lengthy assessment process. And then when they met a white survivor in the same housing program, she had not had to go through the same assessment. So that's an example of the kind of racism they experienced in our intervention system. And that all the survivors who participated observed racism happen within organizations or within our system. Um, so even if, it, even if the survivor wasn't a person of color, they still watched racism happen. Um, so it's important, no matter who, what our organization is made up of, if we're predominantly white, if we're uh, ethnically diverse, if we're a culturally specific organization that's part of a larger organization, all of those different things, it just doesn't matter. All of us need to prioritize anti-racism. And um, in organizations predominantly made of white people, we have, I already kind of mentioned, lots of room to make mistakes. Um, and I think that <clears throat> there's a there's a great art article on that resource list um, that is part of Spectra Speaks, and it's basically she's she's talking there about how um, she doesn't even want to use the word ally because some white folks will call themselves an ally and then think their work is done because they're an ally now, and that it really needs to be about action and and um, tangible steps that we take every day to uh, do something to end racism. And that isn't easy to do because we don't have to see it. Um, we know this about rape culture already. People don't have to see rape culture. Um, men don't have to see rape culture, and they can exist, you know, without 
without seeing sexism and violence against women, um, but that it is everywhere. It's all around us like air and that we need to do something about it. And that's very true of racism too. And so white folks can easily make a lot of mistakes. And here's just a couple of them. Um, I think sometimes we can make it about us, make it about our own journey. Um, something like I've come so far and I, I understand racism so much better and that, that you know, that makes us somehow, um, more important with an anti-racist work because we've given up something and, uh, it's not about us. We're not, it's about, we have work to do and it's about ending racism and, and that, that isn't about us at all. Another mistake is that we expect to be or we wait to be educated by people of color and not, don't take on any of that work our, ourselves. Um, and it's pretty, especially, you know, in the age of blogs and internet, so easy to really, you know, if, if you don't have relation, if you're a white person who don't, who doesn't have a lot of relationships with people of color, we have so much access of reading amazing, smart people um, who can let us see a little window into what experience people of color are having. Um, I think accountability is a big piece of this that it's hard for us to take accountability. This is linked very much to focusing on our attentions and not thinking about our impact that um, we really need to be willing to hear when we make mistakes and really respond to them. And I think, too, that um, white folks are often used to being in charge of things. And I, again, I'm, I'm the executive director of PwC Health, so that I'm speaking for myself in that way. And that uh, for thinking about PwCL in the long haul, wouldn't it be amazing if there was a leader of color in, in this position years from now um, because we've really changed as an organization. I would make, it would make our organization, I think, strong in a, in a really wonderful, wonderful way. And I think the last piece here around mistakes that white folks make as allies is this idea of colorblindness. And this is something that I um, I think about a lot because of an amazing another amazing book that I read called The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, and she talks a lot about how for white people when we think about racism we think of really overt examples of it like lynching or um, you know killing people because they are people of color, and that there's so many different forms of racism that happen all the time and colorblindness in her opinion, is incredibly damaging because when we don't see color, when we assume that everyone has a level playing field, um, we ignore the reality that, that there is no such thing as a level playing field. You know, when we assume that because Barack Obama is president that racism is somehow over, um, we're just ignoring the reality for every person of color in our in our country. Um, and that's very damaging and that it, it's much, much better to acknowledge that people of different ethnicities have very different experiences and that white people carry around privilege all the time. Okay, so somebody in the comment just um, said that has that they've had a person say that they, they are thought of as white. <laughs> and so not only do I not see your color, but I'm going to pretend you're a different color than you really are. Um, not okay and very, very hurtful. And I think, too, that... Um, for white people who are trying to understand anti-racism, that there's a lot of, you know, when we acknowledge that we experience privilege and we're trying to trying to unpack it a little bit, it can be really, um, sometimes you find that you want to separate yourself from other white people because other white people are the problem and not you. And sometimes we have to acknowledge that white people in our lives are racist and have no will, you know, willingness at all to see, that, see themselves that way. Um, and it really takes... It takes a lot of, you know, it is a lot of work, but yet we have to try to avoid these mistakes over here. I'm going to take a moment to read this lengthy comment somebody just made. Okay, so somebody's asked, um, What should we do? And, and I'm really summarizing this this comment, so I apologize if I'm, I'm summarizing it incorrectly. So um, what do we do when we see racism happen, when we see that people, um, that some survivors are, um, let's see, that some survivors who might experience, who might um, act in racist ways, do we see that? 
and what do we do when we come across it. And I will talk a little bit later about what individual advocates can do. Looking at the time, I should go pretty fast. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip to this poll. If you could just answer this question, how common do you think racism ex is experienced by survivors of color within our organization and our intervention systems? Okay, so you can see this too, that so far um, most people think it's incredibly inco incredibly common for survivors of color to experience racism, either incredibly or somewhat common. Okay, so I'm going to really fly through this next piece, and I have to kind of skip around some slides. I did have one comment um, from somebody who asked, what's the difference between cultural competence and anti-racism? Um, and I'm glad that you asked that question. Um, I think that cultural competency, you know, I, I talked a little bit about how we sort of shifted to mean equity and inclusion. Um, so in talking with other organizations who actually put resources around equity and inclusion or cultural competency but had never heard the word anti-racism or the expression anti-racism, you know, it is a pretty different thing. Um, and we talked, we've talked a lot at PWCL about uh, are we anti-racist? Are we committed to racial justice? Are we talking about anti-racism? Um, and what are the nuances of those different choices and the words that we use? And I think that there is a difference between cultural competence, competency and anti-racist work. And by, you know, when we talked about the strategic plan at our board meeting, I had a board member say, like, if we are trying to be anti-racist, does that mean we're racist? <laughs> and um, another board member said, well, you know, every racism is everywhere. So, yes, we all have work to do to be anti-racist. Um, so I think it's a bold way to talk about the work, and it's also, you know, cultural competency becomes a lot of practices and hiring and, um, you know, making sure you have pictures that represent different people in your office space and all those different things. All those things are incredibly important and should happen, but those are kind of like things you check off of the list, and this is me just talking, thinking out loud. I think anti-racist work is more naming something for what it is, acknowledging that racism is a daily experience for people of color in our communities, and recognizing that that means that your service delivery needs to respond adequately to that as best as possible. Um, and I say that because, it's again, it's a work in progress, um, so that you're critically looking at all of those things all the time. Um, someone else talked a little bit about that people of color don't appreciate the term cultural competency. One of the things I took, a, I have a degree in social work, and I took a class about a culturally competent organization, and the instructor on the very first day said, by the way, you will never be competent. <laughs> and so it's a misleading expression, this idea that you have competency when this is something that you will always have to be working on. Someone else made the point that cultural competency tends to hide power, and I think, I wonder if that's, again, because of its, you know, it's often like this checklist, it's somebody... Um, talking about their practices and not necessarily their values and their organizational culture. Okay, so talking about how survivors may be experiencing racism. Um, one, this first one is something that I have certainly been guilty of. So we are talking about changing policy or practice of service delivery, but we're not talking about how that impacts people of different races or ethnicities or language. Um, and so when we're looking at any kind of policy or practice change, you know, right now at PWCL, um, we always look at everything from the trauma-informed lens. So what if we also were looking, and we should be, at everything through the anti-racist lens too? So how will this impact survivors of color specifically before we make this change? Let's talk about that and, and try to try to figure it out. Um, and I think that that's something, and I'll say this again later, but this is a great place for white allies to do some really important work. If you have a Latina advocate on your staff or uh you know, an advocate that works with a specific population, you may notice that that person always has to bring up that population when you're talking about services. What if you did that instead? What if you were the person who brought that up um, as a white ally? It's a place that we should just we should just remember to always do. We should always be looking at it from that lens. 
Another way is, obviously, we've talked about this too, that leadership positions are usually occupied by white people and even sometimes with an organization that serves a population of color. Okay. Somebody asked, um, I, I don't think I have my contact information, um, but I will get that to folks if you all want to keep this conversation once the um, presentation is over. And also, uh, slides will be available too. Sorry, I got sidetracked again by um, comments. Okay, so um, I've talked about this a little bit too, that organizations that are either led by people of color or serving communities of color, they're under resources. They're expected to respond because, um, you know, we, this assumption that they'll do this work for us. Um, and we also don't necessarily recognize the strengths that um, people of color are bringing to the workplace and to service delivery. And we don't always um, take the time to educate ourselves about different communities and how we as service providers can step up and learn more. And oh, likewise, and yeah. I think there was also one other question. I think it was uh, maybe one or two slides back, wondering if you could give an example of the racial impact of policies and procedures. Sure. Um, let me think about that. I wonder, and other people are welcome to, to put that in their comments too, if there's something that you've seen in your own organizations. Um, I think one of the things that, that thinking, you know, we are primarily a crisis line, so something that comes up for us a lot is around um, language capacity on the crisis line and whether or not, you know, when we're thinking about, for example, um, how a survivor accesses, we, we keep um, a shelter callback list of survivors looking for domestic violence shelter, and we have a, a quick pre-screen um, and when we shared it with our peers, there was a lot of concern around how is this going to be experienced by someone who doesn't speak English? How is this going to be experienced by someone who has to work through an interpreter? Um, and so those are questions that we should have asked ourselves before so that when we were sharing it with our peers, we could tell them what we thought and then they could fill in the blanks of places where we're um, where we are not uh, thinking enough. Someone else shared an example of um, requiring a criminal background check for services or requiring proof of citizenship for services. I think that's a really very strong example of not having that lens as you're thinking about what the impact's going to be. Okay. So um, other ways that we're not creating real relationships and partnerships with communities of color and that when we do that, then our services are going to be richer and better and more applicable to various communities. Um, this other piece here, I mean, we've talked a little bit about cultural competency versus anti-racist um, work versus anti-racism versus an racial justice, all these different things. Um, there, you know, when, when we talk within our organization about this work, there's a real desire on um, some of my coworkers to really name things for what they are. And so when we talk about being anti-racist, we're acknowledging that there's racism and that there's racism within are, you know, within the organization that we need to address, within service delivery, within our community and all those different things, then you've got folks who feel very uncomfortable. And so, you know, I know that sometimes I sort of monitor my language and I might use the expression racial justice instead of anti-racist, depending on the person I'm talking to. Um, so we're softening that language. I had a peer talk with me about, so we talk about internalized oppression a lot. Um, in terms of, you know, all kinds of oppression. So, for example, I identify as queer, so where are the ways that I have internalized homophobia? Um, we talk about that pretty easily, but what we may not mention is internalized supremacy. So I'm white. So where are the ways that I experience internalized supremacy where I think, you know, I've really absorbed that racism and what, you know, what am I doing about it? I think that it's that's a pretty bold expression to use. Um, and people are going to feel uncomfortable with it, and sometimes we soften it so that people feel more comfortable around these really uncomfortable things. Um, I talked about this a little bit already, but definitely folks of color within our organizations are experiencing racism all the time, microaggressions, assumptions about who they are, um, being asked to educate the rest of the staff about different communities and all kinds of things like that, and that's happening all the time. Also, employment criteria itself, creating barriers for folks of color to get positions. And I think that this is um, an example of this might be requiring certain levels of education rather than um, understanding that 
experience can sometimes trump education, perhaps, um, but that we really need to look at, you know, how folks are integrated into, how different staff members are integrated into the organization, recognizing that sometimes they're going to have strengths that um, maybe aren't transferable to a resume. Okay. So now to talk about recognizing that I don't have much time left, um, about 25 minutes left, talking about what organizations can do and what we as individuals can do. So um, starting with kind of an action plan, and this is sort of similar to what you saw PWCL having done in our first year, I think, you know, one of the next steps that we need to do is to um, do an organizational assessment to find out where we are today around um, becoming anti-racist to really inform where we need to make priority. And I should, um, I'm going to talk about organizational assessments more in a moment. Uh, it's also important that you have really concrete plans on how to address racism within the organization and within uh, the larger society or intervention system. I think all of us can probably, you know, if we were to think about how we would do this within our own organizations, you probably have some real things that you could do and then there would be a lot that would be unknown. That's certainly been true here. Um, and I think that it's important to know that you're going to have some successes, but also know that it's going to be a work in progress. Um, let's see, I'm just reading a quick comment. So it looks like the city of Seattle has a race and social justice initiative, and it has a toolkit that organizations can use to analyze policies within their agencies, and um, it analyzes those policies in terms of its effects on racism. So that's the Seattle Race and Social Justice Initiative. Looks like a good resource. So other pieces of this action plan would be to partner with communities of color to create really tangible um, relationships across those communities and make sure, again, I talked about being mutually beneficial, make sure that, you know, you're, we're going to ask something of them and we need to give something of ours too, that we're sharing our resources together. And then you need to have a, a set timeline for when you're going to do some of these, creating this action plan um, because it is a work in progress. And this is the way that I think. It's like, you know, we talked for years around uh, racial justice and what does it mean for PWCL, and it wasn't until it was in our strategic plan with tangible action steps that I feel like we're moving somewhere. Someone just commented that changing an organization can take up to seven years to shift a culture. I think that that's probably very true. Um, it's not a fast process by any means. Okay, so conducting an organizational assessment to find out where you are now um, is really important because it's a good starting place. Um, and these are some of the questions that that assessment can, can look at. Um, in your resource list, you'll get, uh, there's an agency called Alianza, and they specifically work on behalf of survivors of domestic violence from the Latino communities. And so they have a really handy organizational assessment that you can um, find on their website. Basically, you're finding out um, who makes decisions, who controls the financial resources is really important. What ways does the organization take the time to talk about racism and oppressions? Um, it's important to talk about what is the culture of the organization. I mentioned at the very beginning that at PWCL we knew that there was a very monolithic um, culture, and so we would kind of get stop stopped there. So acknowledging what's going on um, is really important. I'm going to go ahead and I'm putting in the website for that. Oh, Logan already did it. Okay. So um, in your chat box, you should see that website from the Seattle Social Just Race and Social Justice Initiative. Um, also, the assessment would ask how you work with other other organizations. And, um, you know, the Alianza example is, very, is really quite detailed, and it, it kind of asks you to break out, like, who's on your board and who's, how are people hired and what happens when people are oriented to their new positions. Um, when I first looked at that, their organizational assessment, one of my first thoughts is, oh my gosh, this is going to be really discouraging <laughs> um, because we're going to find out that we're, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and so I think that that is incredibly, that's just the, the truth, <laughs> you know, that you're, when you do this, you might find out that um, there's so much work to do, you don't know where to begin. And so if that happens, I think, you know, sitting with that for a minute or a day or a week and then 
start using that action plan and start chipping away at it is really important. The thing I should say that at PWCL, you know, we've looked at different examples of organizational assessments around racial justice and anti-racist work, and we're actually adapting it to be most um, what, what's going to work within our organization. So we're taking the, the things that work for us and, and trying to kind of create our own. I think, too, that when we do it, we're going to be asking everybody to participate, so staff and volunteers and board members. Um, we have a staff of about 11 or 12 employees, and then we have about 60 volunteers. So it's important that we get that, um, that we definitely get volunteers input in how that, how, where we need to see growth and change. Um, really important. Okay. I'm going to go ahead, I think, and um, I'm going to really go through this part quickly, and then um, I'm going to talk more about what we can do as individuals. And before that, I'm typing the name of Alianza um, in the chat box. And the link will be in your resource guide that Logan will email to you at the end of this presentation. Okay. So um, things that you're going to learn along the way is, um, or things that you are going to help you implement anti-racism into your organization. I think it's really important, um, and this is a tough thing because you don't want to make yourself too too comfortable, um, but first you need to start where your strengths are. You need to understand that um, there are things of you know things within your organization that are going to make this work well, and you can start with those, um, and you can build on those things too. You can also, of course, learn from the mistakes that you've made in the past, things that you don't want to do again, or places where you're going to need some extra support. I think that it's really important to engage the whole organization within this work, and um, this is something I've been at PWCL. It's going to be eight years in, a, in about a month and a half, and so. Um, I feel like this is sort of a personal drive for me within the organization, and I happen to be the executive director, so I'm, that's kind of lucky, you know, and I think that having the leadership of an organization is really important, I, but the work can still be done even if, if, that, if maybe some of the work has to happen there. Um, so making sure that everybody in the organization is engaged and also making sure that um, you have successes and places to work. Um, any, time, any kind of plan you're making, you want to plant some good, some easy successes in there, and then you want to celebrate them when they happen so that, um, so that people feel the momentum to keep going. So at PWCL, for example, we finally had that retreat. You know, it was something that we talked about for the whole year. We had it in June, and it was something that we could say, like, okay, we, you know, we did this. We have this definition now, um, and so we can move from there. I think it's also really important that different, you have to acknowledge that people within your organization are going to have different responses to the process and that um, you got to keep moving forward. And I think that kind of lends itself to the to number four there, which is you don't want resistors to set the pace. So it's important to um, acknowledge when resistance happens in your organization, let people express themselves, and that sometimes you have to move forward even though not everyone is going to be on the same page. Um, and this is only going to work when the people who can make decisions are on the same page. I need to acknowledge that. Um, but moving forward and knowing that sometimes you might have a peop you know, some people in your organization who are a few steps behind is okay because you want to keep on moving. I also think that um, a lot of those moments in your organization are times of growth and that um, this really relies on an organization that can have um, – difficult conversations together. It's certainly not something that has always been true at PWCL, um, but currently we have a team of people who are willing to talk openly about their opinions and experiences. Um, I think that when you're talking about about kind of trying to create an anti-racist culture, you are definitely, um, ex you have to expect to feel uncomfortable and that when you are uncomfortable, it's often where you're going to have the the change or the transformation, and that's true of a, of a team of people. It's true of us as individuals. So um, as much as you can sustain a culture that allows for that is really, really important. 
Okay. The person who I tried to summarize their comment earlier has commented again. Um, and I, so I'm going to go ahead and read it out loud. So, um, I hope that you did understand my comment about immigrants who bring their own racism and prejudice. Moreover, this is an issue that adds to the racism already in this country, which is devoted to fighting racism. What do you think we should approach this kind or we, what do you think we should approach this kind of behavior? Um, so I think that again, that's talking about when you see it, when, um, when participants, when clients are exhibiting any kind of racism and what can you do? And I am going to talk a little bit about what individual advocates can do in just a moment. And that's actually my very next question. So um, within, you know, you've, you've signed up for this webinar. This is obviously important to you as an individual. What do you already do to, to focus on racial justice as an individual advocate? Okay, so um, we can understand that it's a fear based on experiences of something that we can do as individual advocates. What else are folks sharing here? Might be typing. We can di diligently work to unpack and be self-aware, address it and talk about it. You can thank a person who brings it up. Expo be exposed to new experiences, push my comfort zone, work to make organizations more accessible to immigrants, advocate for racial justice in programming, discuss it as a staff on a regular basis, try not to be silent. And this is by a person of color. Try to make it see, try to make the person see it from the end of other person's perspective. Seek out community to explore whiteness, name it, and acknowledge white supremacy. Open dialogue. Attend classes, read materials, increase awareness, impact hiring, and recruitment practices. Make sure I get an interpreter every time a survivor doesn't speak English um, so that they have that access. Be loving and kind as we all struggle. Talk about it with clients, what race means for them and the working relationship. Be thoughtful, educate, engage with uncomfortable conversations. And then invite clients to design their own treatment plans. Try to understand the historical and current experiences of people in color, of color. This is somebody who comes from outside of the community that they're serving. Talk with clients about how they feel about having a white therapist. Okay, admit when I've made a mistake. These are great. I'm gonna um, keep moving through. You've kind of named some of the things that I was gonna talk about. Um, so like Logan said, and like I mentioned, I did present the same workshop or a similar workshop at their uh, annual conference. And I happened to be in the same, I, um, happy to be in the same room, the workshop before mine. And I overheard a couple people talking and one of them said, I want to go to that anti-racism workshop, but I don't get to make any decisions in my organization. I think it would be too discouraging. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, so I wanted to just take a moment to talk a little bit about what individuals can do. And I really appreciate all the ways that you've shared. Um, I think that all of these things are definitely on this list. So, um, we can do a lot as individuals, even if we don't make decisions within our organizations. And we kind of, we of course need to start with ourselves. Um, and you all have mentioned some of these tangible things that you can do to kind of do your own self-assessment. Um, this is going to be included in that resource list as well as where it came from, this, these self-assessment questions. So definitely educating ourselves. I've already mentioned, you know, there's so many resources out there to do that. Um, we need to, as individuals, we really need to reflect on our lives and, and figure out, you know, why we think the way we think. Um, and sometimes that means going back into your experience as a kid. Um, and really, for me, for example, I think about um, experiences that I had as a young person, and that maybe it doesn't help me. Um, it, it helps me understand where I'm, where my responses are coming from. Um, and so it, 
it puts sort of a, they, those responses become a little less emotional because I understand where they began. Um, so it's been helpful for me as an individual person to try to look back and really understand where I'm coming from. Um, so re reflecting on your own life, um, look at your own attitudes and behaviors and be really honest with yourself aware, on where you collude with racism, where you um, have work to do with internalized supremacy. So part of that is self-assessment, thinking about the language you use, um, see, trying to figure out if they are subtly racist, if they reinforce this idea that some people are better than others. Avoid stereotyping and generalizing about people based on their race. Um, I think that this is something that we all have work to do and it's important to just, you know, again, treat people as individuals and try to leave those generalizations behind as much, most as you can. Um, we talked about color blindness already. So you want to see those differences in other people. You want to acknowledge that the color of a person's skin impacts their experience in the world every day and that you need to see the color of their skin. You need to acknowledge that that's, that's true for them. Be willing to explore and discuss um, racism and have some comfort. And I already mentioned that you're going to be uncomfortable, but you have to be willing. You know, it's almost like the comfort is in being uncomfortable. Um, so you have to be willing to do that. And also you need to be willing to hear when you've made a mistake and when people are pointing those, those mistakes out to you. Um, I think that this is something that I think a lot about as a white person, this idea of calling in. I hope that people will call me in as opposed to call me out. Basically what that means is if you're if somebody makes a mistake um, and you know they have a personal commitment to being anti-racist, make maybe you can um, call call out the behavior but in such a way that is curious or um, gives them space to really learn from that mistake so that um, they can keep on keep on moving forward. Sometimes I think that we call people out and we say, you know, like, you know, you're see, you really are racist, even though you have these anti-racist values. You really are racist, and that's terrible. Um, that is true, and it is terrible, but it's a, it's a work in progress. So um, I think so. All of you have already talked about ways that you incorporate your own anti-racist values into your service delivery. So people talked about that they always use an interpreter if the person doesn't speak English as a way to make sure that that, that participant can ask for exactly what they need. Um, you can have that anti-racist lens when you're talking about service delivery and impact. Some of you mentioned um, as an individual, you just acknowledge if you're a white, a white advocate working with a survivor of color, you acknowledge that. And that can, you know, it can feel very awkward, but it really can have a large impact just to say, um, you know, so for an example, I'm thinking about like if you're working with a survivor of color and maybe you're asking them about whether or not they're considering accessing law enforcement to so acknowledge, like, you know, if you're working with a survivor of color, you might say, you know, law enforcement might not seem like a, fa a safe option because I know that they can be very racist. Is that something that you're thinking about? You know, just acknowledging that can help that survivor know that they don't, that they can go there with you, that, that, that you have some basic understanding of that reality. Okay. So um, I've already talked a little bit about speaking up for survivors and advocates of color in your staff meetings, both in your organizations, and that this is really important if, to do if you're white. And it's a good thing for you to just sort of program your brain to ask that question so that the folks around you, if you've got coworkers of color, they don't have to do that. And you're stepping up to take that on. Um, and it's part of having that anti-racist lens in your service delivery. It's also really important that you have allies within your organization, especially if the leadership of the organization isn't aligned with those values, that you can have people to go to to either vent or get ideas. It, sometimes you might find that those folks are um, at different levels of your organization. Maybe you have a board member who really cares about this um, and can help be a great ally at the leadership level. And I think, too, when you're working with other organizations, you need to be model that um, partnership with your to your coworkers, thinking about those mutually beneficial relationships, um, demonstrating a lot of respect for other programs that are serving survivors of color and are going above and beyond every day because we ask them to, um, and really appreciating appreciating those partners and being a good model for the way that we that everybody should be appreciating those partners.
Okay. So um, that is it. Um, we've got our last little hooray for second wave feminism slide on this last page. Um, I think that as individuals, regardless of the position within our agencies, when we understand that racism is impacting our service delivery, then um, we're really helping our organizations change and that that will ultimately hopefully result in survivors having better experiences. And that for us as individuals trying to make the world better when we are incorporating anti-racist values into that work, we're, we're better activists, we're better advocates, um, and so we benefit too. Okay. So somebody, I just want to say that somebody in the comment here, um, one of the ways that we can think about uh, an example where um, a service delivery choice is colluding with racism, somebody pointed out that when you go to pwcl.org, it has a pop-up message that instructs people in danger to call 911. And what we know is that if somebody is not documented and they call 911, they might be detained. So that is a perfect, somebody brought up the point, like it's ironic that that happens at our website when we're, when I'm asking you to have those lenses, um, because we could take that down. We could like uh, talk about law enforcement isn't the safest option for everybody. Um, okay. Somebody is saying that calling 911 is a ticket to trouble. I'm um, so somebody, the, the person has restated their question around. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and read it. We help victims from Middle Eastern countries. Some of these victims value people by their skin color, even if these people are advocates. Moreover, lighted skin people from Middle East have racist ideas, just like some white people here or anywhere else. My question is, how do you think we should approach this kind of behavior when it comes from a survivor? when she or he needs help from us. Um, so I think this is a really tough question because, you know, I, having worked at a shelter where we had to kind of acknowledge that, you know, we had gone through training, we had shared values as an organization, but the participants who came through our doors didn't necessarily go through all those trainings or have the same languages and tools around racism and homophobia and um, all those different, you know, victim blaming, all those different things. And I think that, it's a very difficult thing to do to to call in a survivor you're trying to help um, and that you really have to make choices around that that is supporting that survivor and their individual um, where they are. If they are in immediate crisis, it might not be the time to interrupt a racist comment. However, if you have an ongoing relationship with them um, and you're working with them, I think it's perfectly okay to talk about, you know, if you notice that they are, are preferring maybe a light-skinned advocate over a dark-skinned advocate, um, that you are letting them know that they, they should expect the same level of service from each person and that you're noticing that they're having a preference and that at your organization, um, they should expect the same service from every person, every staff member. And I think just kind of noticing it is important. One way, um, there's a really wonderful woman at the Nonprofit Association of Oregon named Guadalupe Guajardo, and she has taught me to really approach things with curiosity as opposed to defensiveness. And I think when you're working with participants and clients, curiosity is really helpful. Um, so if you can if you can acknowledge, like I noticed that you have a preference for working with this person, why is that? You know, and just um, having that curiosity can be a, a gentle way of of interrupting a behavior and having that conversation. I don't think we can expect participants in crisis to um, want to go into a racial analysis with us about oppressions. However, it's okay to um, to observe things. It's okay to say ouch when somebody has said something that's really overtly racist. It's never okay for an advocate of color, for any person to be um, verbally I want to use the word assaulted, but that doesn't, I'm not totally comfortable with that word. Um, it's not okay to be named called. It's not okay to be mistreated by the folks we're trying to serve. And those are boundaries that we should always, always be using. And at the same time, I think we need to have some awareness that, um, that maybe that's not the time to do a lot of analysis with somebody. Um, someone just commented, we should ask only to assure them of your services, but not judge their preferences. 
I do think we just need to be very gentle with participants, um, but also be willing to have some of those uncomfortable conversations. Okay. So um, that is it for me, and I know that we are just right at 11.30, um, and somebody is commenting we need, next next training should be about how we call out and um, call in people who are colleagues and partners. I think that's a great idea. I really appreciate your participation. It's been nice to have your comments, and um, Please do check out, the, you'll get the slides and the resource list and then also evaluation of today's webinar. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and thank everyone on the call for just really engaging um, with this topic today and sharing um, their insights and input on the chat so that we can all learn from each other. Um, so like I said, please um, keep your eye out in your email box, perhaps your spam folder for that um, That attendance confirmation that we'll also have those resources available for download. Have a wonderful day, everyone.